Good morning, everybody. It's the morning after our third episode of Project Runway, and I'm sitting here among a zillion copies of my book because I'm signing them for an event next week. I'm pre-signing them, actually. Um, I have to tell you something about the whole nature of the challenge that we presented the designers with, and that has to do with what, for me, ended up being something very confusing in terms of navigating the workroom and having critique with the designers, and that was the idea of copying, ah, using the wrong word, creating a derived design from the high-end look of another team. Um, I'm assuming if you're watching this that you saw the show, so I hope I'm not giving anything away. Um, but to recap briefly, um, we took the designers to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the fabulous Metropolitan Museum of Art. We were in the New American Wing, specifically the Charles Engel Engelhardt Court, and the incredible Harold Coda, the chief curator of the Costum Institute, had um, brought in ten iconic looks from very, very famous designers. Everyone's deceased. We thought we don't want to get into the situation where we have some living designers, because we could have, um, but we thought, let's not go there. So the designers were truly inspired, as a matter of fact. There was a no-touch codicil. And wouldn't you know, there were hands and almost feet all over most of those garments. And I spent most of my time shrilly saying, how many times do I have to say this? At any rate, we had a great time. Chose our teams. Um, I tell the designers that they have two days for the challenge. The morning of the second day, I walk in and say, guess what, there's a surprise. Of course, it's two days on Project Runway, there's gotta be a surprise. So, each team had to take the high-end look of another team and make it for less, basically. It's a look for less. Um, they had $500 budget, record on Project Runway, $500 for the high-end look, they had $50 for the less expensive look. But as I said to them, you are not to be design pirates. You're not to copy the high-end look. It's a derivation. And what I'm getting at, the point of this long-winded story is to say that this is a pervasive issue in this nation. Um, I've been working with the Council of Fashion Designers um, and with their president, Diane von Furstenberg, and their executive director, Stephen Kolb, and with a, <clears throat> excuse me, with a fabulous lobbyist, Liz Robbins, um, and we've been on Capitol Hill uh, campaigning and advocating for the, a Design Piracy Prohibition Act that would give intellectual property to fashion designers. In this nation, they don't have them. And I actually have a theory about that. And my theory is that up until World War II, we were a nation of fashion copiers. All we ever did was copy what was happening in Europe. There wasn't an original thought here, except in Hollywood. Indeed, there, was a, there were original thoughts there. But in terms of a ready-to-wear fashion industry in America, it was copycat land. So there wasn't any desire to put a, a bill like this, this into effect, and we inherit it still today. Um, but we're making progress, we're making headway, and I'm confident that there will be a Design Piracy Prohibition Act in the not-too-distant future, which will be great for everyone in this field. So, there, so at any rate, going around the workroom, I kept asking myself, what am I looking at? Is it the high-end look? Is it the derived look? Whose team? What? When? Where? And then I thought, and I asked the producers, how are we going to walk this on the runway? Um, how are we going to make it clear to the judges whose look is whose? Um, and even last night, my head was spinning. I thought, really? Is that what we're doing? And I have to say, you know my position about the judges. I'll just say, I don't smoke crack. Um, they singled out as the best looks the uh, Team Mila, Mila and Jonathan, Bravo, Bravo, yes, that should certainly have, have been singled out, and Team J, J and Maya. I loved their high-end look. I was crazy about it, but can I be blunt? I thought that their, their derived look was a copycat. I mean, I know Michael talked about how it was so much better than the high-end look from which it was derived, and that was the work of Janine and Ben? Yes. Um, I, I didn't agree. I thought if you look at the individual items, if you look at the color story, it was copycat land. Where's Alan Schwartz? Gone right over to Century 21, um, or Forever 21. What am I saying? I've already bought real estate. I don't need Century 21. Um, so at any rate, I was perplexed, and they 
the judges were not complimentary at all about the, the Mila and Jonathan um, derived look. Well, look what they had as a point of departure. They had Cotton Candy Land from Anthony and Seth Aaron. Um, uh, in fact, a bumblebee cotton, piece of cotton candy, that yellow and that black at any rate. Um, I thought that they did a great job. They made it youthful. Um, yes, uh, the, um, what do I want to say? Uh, uh, baby doll silhouette is not the most flattering thing for most people, but it's youthful. And if they'd lowered the waistline, that would have been a dumpy, horrible look. So I thought they mitigated all the issues that they needed to and really did a wonderful job, and I'm proud of them. And congratulations to Mila. Did a fabulous job. You and Jonathan. I have to add to, whoops, I'm knocking over my books. Um, the Mila-Jonathan collaboration reminded me of the Christian-Chris March collaboration in season four. Also, also no, it was the, not from the Costume Institute. That was, never mind. Um, the reason I say that is because I feel this, the, the same about the outcome of both teams. It was a case of one plus one equals ten. Um, Mila's concept was fantastic but ambitious. Jonathan is deft and adept at execution, and he did a wonderful job. Um, and those two looks wouldn't have walked the runway without both of them. Um, and it was just a, a, a superb collaboration, and I love their work. So congratulations. Bye, everybody.